Please turn in your Bibles to John 20. I'll be reading from verse 1 all the way to 4. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciples outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Well, I think I can now say good afternoon. <laughs> I don't see Jessica yet, so I'll handle the, uh, her announcement at the end. But I do have an announcement for each of you. Uh, how many of you were here for breakfast this morning? How many of you are really full from breakfast this morning? If you brought something for breakfast, uh, your dishes are down in the kindergarten room. They are ready for pickup. Uh, we, we brought a couple of dogs along, and, and we just kind of put the, the dishes down on the ground and let the dogs... I'm kidding. <laughs> so uh, after service, make sure you grab your dishes, or they will become property of the Paw Paw Adventist Church. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, <laughs> I want to say a big thank you to all of our musicians who have played a part of our service today, all of the deacons, deaconesses, Giovanni and your family. We will definitely miss seeing you up front, but uh, we know that, it, like Janelle said, it won't be the last time that we'll see you here in Paw Paw. And so uh, we just want to pray that God would be with you as you, you journey to warmer weathers. <laughs> But we, we will covet your weather in February, and we will not in July. <laughs> so, all right. What I want to share with you today is the last sermon out of my Gospel of John series. Uh, I, I knew that today was going to be a little bit more packed of a church service, and so I wanted to do a little bit shorter of a sermon. And I thought, what better sermon to preach than just a real short, almost cute little story unique to the Gospel of John, the story of a simple race that happened between Peter and John when they heard the news that he's gone. I love it. Simple story. It's actually kind of fitting for me to be able to preach today. All the emphasis on racing and running, it kind of feels like that. Uh, as my Sabbath gets busier and busier, it kind of feels like you're running a marathon sometimes. And as many of you might know, I've never run a full marathon, but I'm not afraid of a half marathon. One of my preferred things to do, if I have a, a few extra minutes, get out on the road, put on my shoes, hit the trails, and go off running. I, I know that there's a few other runners around here. Uh, how many of you have, just so I know if I'm in good company, how, how many of you have ever run at least a 5K before? How many of you have no idea what a 5K is? <laughs> All right, there we go. 5K is approximately 3.1 miles. And so it's, it's quite the race. Has anybody ever done a longer race? Any 10K runners? Any half marathoners? Any full marathons? One in the back. Go, Karen. <laughs> so. Getting out and running, this story kind of connects with me a little bit. But the more that I read the story, the more it connects with me. And I pray that it connects with you as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to take this opportunity to hear you speak to us. Lord, as we open your word, we pray that your spirit would guide us into your truth. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Short passage. John chapter 20. We've already read all the way through verse 4 in our scripture reading. I'm going to read the rest of the story for you to make sure that we all have at least a basic understanding of the race that I'm talking about here. And then I'm going to go back through and add a few comments. Starting in verse 5. And he, this is the other disciple. And who is that other disciple, by the way? This would have been John. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, and yet he did not go in. 
And then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there, for the handkerchief, or, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Simple little story, right? But is there actually a lot of depth just under the surface? The first thing that stands out to me in this story is think about this. The news comes out, and, and who was the first messenger of the news, by the way, that the tomb is empty? It was a woman. It was Mary Magdalene. She got up and she preached to the disciples, the tomb is empty. And of the 11 who remained, two of them took off, Peter and John. Now, some people argue, was it because John was young and Peter was old? We don't know why. It could just be that Peter got beat. But what we do know is John gets to the tomb first. But an interesting question comes into my mind. Is it possible to run faster without running harder? What do I mean by this? John outruns Peter, and he's running, and he's running, and he's running, and he gets to the tomb. And effectively what it says is he gets to the tomb. Yep, it's empty. He doesn't go into the tomb. It, what it says in the scriptures is that he looked and he saw. This is in verse 5. He stooped down and, he's, and looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Something kind of funny happens. You don't catch it in the English. How many of you are familiar with what happens in the next chapter? When Jesus appears to Peter and he asks him three different times, do you love me? And you may have heard before that when he asks, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. They're using different Greek words. And so maybe some of you have probably had it pointed out to you that there are different Greek words to, to, that are translated the same way. The word saw here becomes very important. I want you to pay attention to the word saw in these contexts. The first time that it says the word saw, the Greek word is blepo. Repeat after me, blepo. Blepo. Blepo is a very basic Greek word for saw. When I was in the undergrad and I had to learn uh, Greek, blepo is where I started. Blepo is a, it's a passing uh, element before your eyes. You see that it happened, and, and not too much detail beyond that. And that's actually fairly fitting for the way that John seemed to, to meet with this. Uh, when, when he gets to the tomb, he gets there, he pokes his head in. He doesn't even bother to go in. He pokes his head in, sees the linen cloths, pulls his head out, and says, yeah, there's nothing. Is it possible to run faster without running harder? I ask this question because of what happens next. Peter comes, following him, and yet he went into the tomb in verse 6. John was running a race for the sake of racing against Peter. Peter was running a race for the sake of running to Jesus. And so when John gets there, and he just looks and he glances, it's a passing glance. Is it possible that maybe he put on this big show, and that's what it was, a big show? Do we ever wrestle with that sometimes, wanting to put on a big show for the people watching around us? We want to look like we're running harder. We want to look like we're running faster because of something for Jesus. We want to get some sort of accolade or, or some sort of acknowledgement. And so we'll, we'll, we'll look busier in order to impress people? Is it possible to run faster without running harder? I think, for example, of what happened, uh, how many of you know who Usain Bolt is? You've heard of the Olympic sprinter, Bolt? If you go and you look at some of his videos and you see how much faster he is than everybody, it'll get to the point where in a couple of his races, while he's running, he'll actually look around and see where everybody else is and then he'll kind of stride across the finish line like this. And everybody else is running like their hair is on fire. 
and he's like skipping across the finish line. He's so much faster than everybody. I actually experienced this very feeling in my own life when I ran my very first half marathon about two and a half years ago. I was running a half marathon in Kalamazoo, and so I, I'm running, and I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty excited with myself. I've only stopped like 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I'm running, and, and right about, oh, the 11 mile marker, I am just dying, but I know that I have less than a 5K to go. I'm gonna make it, here we go. And so I'm running and all of a sudden behind me, you know, there's been people cheering you on in all sorts of ways all along the way, signs and, and people cheering and clapping and, and all of that. And then all of a sudden behind me, I hear sirens, like police sirens. And I'm like, well, that's, that's interesting. You know, is it like, ha ha, run from the cops. Here comes the cops, run from them. Sort of encouragement. Was this one of those things? And then I realized what was really going on is a motorcycle cop goes blowing by me on like an itty bitty little sidewalk trail coming into the park. A motorcycle cop goes, I'm like, where's he going? And right behind him is the lead marathon runner. The marathon runner started 20 minutes before the half marathoners. This dude got a 20 minute head start and ran 13 miles more than me. <laughs> and so like, as I'm, I'm doing my shuffle, I'm like, <laughs> and he runs by me like full form, like he's on ESPN. <laughs> it doesn't even look like he's trying and I can barely breathe. And so, I made it my own personal goal, just so you know, to never get beat by a marathon runner again. <laughs> Is it possible to run faster without running harder? Was John running to get to the tomb just for the sake of racing with Peter? Why didn't he go in? And in fact, when he did take the opportunity, why was it just a passing glance? You see the difference that happens when Peter, remember, Peter was running not with John, he was running to Jesus. If you ask anybody who's ever run a race, for me, I, when I finished 1500th in that half marathon, yeah! <laughs> when I finished 1500th in that half marathon, I wasn't, I wasn't discouraged because I got beat by 1400 other people, including like a thousand women. I didn't feel bad about that. Because to me, the race wasn't against all of the other people in the crowd. The race was me versus the course. That was the race. It was me versus the course, and I won, barely. So when Peter gets there, he runs past John. He came, he followed him, he went into the tomb. He didn't care what John was up to. He wanted Jesus. And this is actually, it's, it's incredibly significant to me. Because why is Peter running so hard to see Jesus? What had happened the last time that Peter and Jesus were together? The denials, the betrayal, that horrible night, that awful day when Peter gave up everything in his relationship with Jesus. And so when the word came out that the tomb was empty, Peter panicked. Where is my best friend? What happened to him? I've got to find a way. I've got to figure out where he is. I've got to go see him. And so he runs and he gets to the tomb and he goes in all the way. And while he's in there, it says that he looked and he saw. Now, the first time we saw the word saw in John chapter 20, what was the Greek word? Blepo. Blepo. Very good. Some of you remember that. The, would it surprise you to know that in John chapter 20 and verse, uh, verse 6, and he saw the linen clothes lying there? Would it surprise you at all to know that that's a different Greek word for the word saw? The word saw there is theoreo. Say it with me. Theoreo. 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 It is a very obscure Greek word. In fact, when I studied Greek in the undergrad, I never learned this word. I, may, I might have been supposed to, but I never did learn this word. And so I had to go back and I had to look it up. I was like, what is this word? And sure enough, it means saw. But it's a little bit more than just something passing in front of your eyes. Something has now clicked into your brain. And so you see this, for example, when Peter walks into the tomb, it's no longer uh, where John noticed the linen clothes. Oh, nice, there's linen clothes. Peter noticed some specific details about them, a little bit more analysis. He noticed that they were folded up nicely, which leads to all sorts of questions. 
if they had stolen his body, wouldn't they have taken the clothes? If somebody had done something sneaky with the tomb, wouldn't the clothes have just been in a pile? Who would take the time to rob a grave and yet fold up the clothes? Something's not quite right here with this, this crime scene. Peter doesn't quite get it yet, but he looks and he saw, and he observes the details. Simon Peter came in following him. He went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes laying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, the one who got to the tomb first, the one who's still standing outside, he went in also. And he saw and he believed. Would it surprise you to know that that is yet another Greek word for saw? The first one was blepo. The second one was theoreo. The third one here is arao, which is actually a very commonly occurring Greek word. And this one really means it's, it's gone past simply details in front of your eyes or even some, some basic processing that's going on. But this is something that has gone past your brain and almost into your heart. It's something that you contemplate. It's something that you've wrestled with. It's something that has pushed you a little bit. And so John, when he goes in, he doesn't go into scanning for details. He goes in and he looks with open eyes and an open heart. And he looks and he believed. What did he believe? Well, we know one thing's for sure, that according to verse 9, at this point he couldn't give a Bible study on, on the resurrection. He hadn't yet figured out the scriptures. But somewhere in there, he heard the words of Jesus starting to come back to him, that he's supposed to rise. Somewhere in there, John realized this is more than just a simple encounter at the tomb. Something tragic had happened to this tomb. He realized something more had gone on, and he looked and he believed that Jesus had risen. And so that's the end of the story. After this, John goes home. He and the other disciple went away back to their own home. They yet didn't have it figured out. By the end of the day, Jesus would finally appear to them in that, that wonderful uh, meeting that happens later on in the book, and, and that's for another sermon series. But what I want to share with you is something that's interesting to me, is when I think about this story, if John had gone by himself, hey, John, you're a young man. Why don't you just make the trip? You're energetic. Why don't you just go for it? You know how we like to send the kids. They're young and energetic. Just go, go check it out. Would John have stayed on the outside? Would John have gotten there but not been willing to go in? What did it take to encourage John to take those extra steps? What did it take to encourage John in his faith, in his journey of Jesus, to take those steps when it meant doing something difficult? The answer is a friend. The answer is a friend. A lot of people have this picture of John and Peter as being rivals. John and Peter, did they clash with each other? Did they, did they uh, fight with each other? Well, we know that by the time the book of Acts rolls around, John and Peter have become ministry partners. And we know they're not perfect yet. By the end of the book, there's still some rivalry going on. But somewhere in here, John realized that if it wasn't for Peter, who wasn't just running for show, he was running for Jesus that John might have still been on the outside of that tomb wondering really what was inside. How many of us sometimes wish that we had the ability to really step out in faith? You know that there's something that you need to do. You really just need to take that extra step in faith sometimes. And it's hard to do it alone, isn't it? It's hard to be that one who steps away from the pack, who steps away from the herd, if you will, because you're afraid that you're going to be like a gazelle in a documentary. When you step away from the herd, you, you take that extra step and you're all alone. It can be scary to take that step, can't it? And so one of the things that 
I really like about Jessica here today making this decision for baptism. It was a decision that she really made by herself to step out, but it was one that was encouraged and motivated by friends and family, people who were there with her to encourage her to take that extra step. How many of you, like I said, I asked you at the beginning, I'll ask you again, how many of you were here to be able to celebrate with Jessica? You've, you've been with her, you've seen her, you know her, and you're, you just wanted to be here with her to encourage her. She takes that next step. How many of you came? Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to ask you, how many of you have a, your own next step in your life that you need to take? Something in your life that you're wrestling with? Some decision you need to make? Some change you need to make? You know what? Just being encouraged to read, to pray, to study, to do whatever, and you're afraid to take that next step. I know I am. Even as your pastor, I have to confess to you, Sometimes it really is hard for me even to take that next step in faith. I'm human, I'll admit it. And so I'm so thankful to have people in my life who can encourage me to take that next step. People like my wife. People like my elders here at the church. And many of our families and even our kids to encourage me to take my next step in faith, to get out of my comfort zone occasionally and, and to step into the tomb, if you will, to take that one step closer to experiencing Jesus. And so what I want to do, to you, what I want to do today is I want to ask you, I talked about it last week with asking for the Holy Spirit. You, you really want to have this connection with the Holy Spirit. You want to draw closer to him. And, and some of you wrestled with, with how do you make this decision? Or some of you might be wondering, for example, coming up New Year's resolutions. We're going to have all sorts of New Year's resolutions. We want to get in shape. We want to read our Bibles more. Things like that. Might I encourage you to find a running buddy, either physically or spiritually? One of the things that I love about running is the opportunity to run not just by myself, but with others. That's one of the great things about running races is especially, for example, the camp meeting 5K, getting out there and, and just running out on the roads with my church members, my church family. And so I had the opportunity to, to run this past year for most of the race side by side with Kira Hill. Is she here today? She's over here, that's right. And, and if you remember correctly, we ran together for a bit of the race. Was it quiet as I was running next to you? No. For part of the race, I was screaming at you, wasn't I? Run faster, Kiera, because she had a goal in mind, and she told me this ahead of time. I want to run a 30-minute 5K. And so I ran, I had my watch, I had my pacing, and I'm running side by side with her, screaming at her, come on, Kiera, you can do it. And the clock said you missed it by like seven seconds. You ran a 30-minute 5K. It was great to do that. And then when I was done, I was like, you know what? I'm not tired yet. I'm just getting started. And so to get out there, and then I went out on the course a little bit further, and I found another person, another church member. A anybody know who that is? Raise your hand if you know who that one was that I hunted down. That was you that I found next. <laughs> I found Carissa later. I ran with, with Carrie and said, hey, watch out for this spot. Uh, if anybody's run the camp meeting 5K, you know that they take you down those winding dirt roads uh, along Faculty Drive. And I told her where to run and where not to run. And, and I told her what to watch out for. And, and hey, you've got a downhill coming up. Use this energy here. Because I had been through those steps and was able to encourage her, sometimes friendly, sometimes not so much so, <laughs> to take those extra steps. And then when I finished with Carrie, I went out and I said, okay, I'm going to go find Carissa. Because Carissa's running the 10K. And Carissa knew that same lesson. Carissa knew the power of running with a friend. She wasn't out running by herself. She was actually running with my boss, Elder Snayman, who preached here a couple of months ago. And, and so the two of you were running together, and I came and joined, and, and, and the three of us went together through this. And so she laughed at me, because I'm sitting here and I'm telling her, okay, you're going to turn this corner, and it's going to be like this and that. And she's like, yeah, whatever, fine. And she told me later, she's like, actually, you were right about the course. And, and so... 
I'd been there, I'd run it before. I knew what was going on. And so it was neat to be able to kind of share from my own experience what's coming next and how to get ready for it. Why don't we do that with our spiritual lives? The scriptures talk several times about the value of our elderly people training up the younger people who have walked the dusty roads, who know where the hills and the valleys are. What do we do to encourage our community to draw together to encourage each other spiritually? Because we're all running a race, aren't we? And I hope we're all running for Jesus not just running for show. What do we do to encourage each other to take that extra step, to push it just a little bit further, to get out of your comfort zone? I was really impressed a couple of weeks ago when one of my elders sent me a message and said, hey, I just really felt impressed to do this. I'm going to start praying for, for church family in a very specific way this week. And so I'm, I'm making phone calls. I'm sending text messages. It doesn't have to be hard to build some of these spiritual relationships. Sometimes a simple text message can mean the world. Amen, Andrews Academy friends. Sometimes a text message can mean a, a big, big impact in your lives, right? You don't have to have a seminary degree to send somebody a text message to say, hey, I'm praying for you today. Is there something specific I can pray for? And so what I want to encourage you to do this week, church family, I slaved for 10 months to get those directories out. They went out last week. Do something with them. (laughs) Reach out to somebody. Send an email. Make a phone call. Send a text. And said, hey, I want to pray for you as you run to Jesus this week. Will you pray for me? Find a running buddy. Somebody who will help you to take that next step. It might be your spouse. It might be your neighbor. It might be somebody that sits across the aisle from you that you've never actually said a word to. But you say, you know what? I want to encourage you and you run with Jesus. You never know when the person sitting next to you who doesn't know you at all, is going to say the exact words that encourage you to make that life-changing decision. Can I get an amen out of Jessica on that one? (laughs) Find a running buddy. Pray for each other. Make a difference this week. What I want to do before we sing our closing song today is I want to invite Jessica to come forward. We've got a gift for you. Actually, a few gifts for you. Jessica, come on, come. Come, come. It's present time. (laughs) On behalf of the Paw Paw Seventh-day Adventist Church family, I want to welcome you into our community officially. You've been part of the family for a while. And so we've got uh, got a few things for you to encourage you. The church has a nice rose for you here. And these flowers were special from your parents for you. And so you'll make sure to take those home as well. I want to welcome you to the church, and I want you to know that you don't have to make this journey alone as you run to Jesus. You've got a church family who's going to be here for you to encourage you when life gets hard. We'll be here to to support you. That's what it means to be a church of refuge, to be by your side during life's challenges and to support you and uplift you. You've also got a whole group of young people down here who love you enough that they were willing to make that long trip up 94 (laughs) to come and see you. And so I pray that God would be with you as you journey. Thank you, Jessica. For the rest of you, church family. What I want to do today to close our service is I want to do my annual Christmas song. I taught it to you last year. If you weren't here last year or you forgot it, what we're going to do today, you've already sung the tune Joy to the World once today. 
But what you're going to do is you're going to sing the tune, Joy to the World, but you're going to use different words. And the words you're going to use are the words of amazing grace. And so it's going to go something like this. Instead of joy to the world, it's going to be amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yeah, that's the song we're going to do. And so what I want you to do is I want you to stand. We're going to do two verses, the first and the last, uh, amazing grace, and then the last one is when we've been there 10,000 years. The words are going to be up on the screens. I want you to sing along this holiday season. The mashup between Jesus coming and Jesus dying for you and for me. Joy to the world and amazing grace together. Father in heaven, I pray your blessing will be upon each of us this day. As we prepare to depart from this place, may we not depart from your presence. And when we go, help us to not run the race of faith alone. As we run to Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would lift up somebody in each of our lives who can encourage us as we go. Somebody who will encourage us to take that extra step and to get out of our comfort zone because we do it all for Jesus. Lord, I pray your blessing upon us this day in his name. Amen. Amen.